two of the commission, PUD commission candidates, if you, want, if you want to call them that, are, are in attendance tonight. Uh, Bob Sokol and Barney Burke. Is the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth potential candidate here? And you are. Thank you, Bill. Get a taste of what this commissioner is all about. We've gone through the formal presentations. We'd like to invite your questions. Please address a question to a specific panelist, if you will. Questions uh, preferable are uh, concerning open records and open meetings. And you're welcome to uh, join us at the microphone if you do not wish to come down to the microphone but have written that question on a piece of paper. I'll be glad to collect that if you just pass it off to the aisle and raise your hand. Now, this will be a multiple choice question. I don't know who's going to best answer it. As uh, citizens, we pay our taxes. Our taxes get doled out in grants to universities for research. They get doled out to private organizations to do projects. To what extent are the records created by researchers in the sciences, in the universities, in private institutions that are contracted by the state, and the organizations to which grants are given to perform such things as environmental projects to what extent are the documents created in the process of those processes discoverable, open records? Tim or Toby, which one wants to try that one? That's a good question. Um, occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, it's not quite clear whether a, an entity is a public agency subject to the Public Records Act. And it could be a, a University, um, it's a public university, they have public records that's subject to the records. But there was some appellate cases recently where there were private nonprofit corporations that were receiving government funding for their mission. And the question was whether those entities, nonprofit corporations, were subject to the Public Records Act. And the Court of Appeals applied a four part test and determined that if you met some of these factors, you didn't need to meet all of them, but if on the average an entity was the functional equivalent of a public agency, then yes, it was subject to the Public Records Act and had to disclose. And some of the factors are what level of funding they're receiving from the government, how much regulation and control, how were they created, uh, what their purpose is, do they provide a, a public purpose? Things like that. So you look at all those factors, and uh, occasionally I get this question, and I, I try to assist the public with analyzing the facts because it's very factually dependent. I was trying to look it up on my cell phone here. <laughs> um, there is a an exemption for formulas and various other types of information, which is, my recollection is, is very broad. And um, uh, so some of those scientific things might be exempt under that provision. Um, but it's something that I would really have to research. That's not a question I've ever gotten before. Okay. That was a challenging question, Jerry. Yeah. As the person who sits on the committee, which reviews uh, retention schedules from all state agencies and all local government agencies, I have seen in the last uh, 20 years an increasing willingness to restrict access to or declaring them confidential or wanting to destroy them after a short period of time, four, five, six years, because uh, of the uh, one of the arguments that I've heard is that we don't, uh, the university has invested a lot of money in this particular project, and we don't want somebody to come along and take advantage of it 10 years from now. It could be some invention, some creation. As you know, universities are into making, they have special departments which are aimed at inventions and keeping copyrights and trademarks and 
all these benefits so that they can generate income from revenue from these things. So I think that's why you'll see some of these research projects are restricted. Who, who owns those uh, trademarks and copyrights since they may be public institutions, does the public have a right to them? Yes, no. It depends on the contract. You know, I've seen uh, contracts that are very restricted. You know, it's uh, this is very um, it's this is full of lawyering uh, on the on both sides. And I have made the point as a researcher that. I taught at a university for uh, my first eight years uh, after graduate school, and it was a university that invented Crest toothpaste. And uh, they, they generated a lot of money off of it. And they certainly weren't going to let some competitor come along and look at the research uh, to uh, compete with them. So it, there's a lot of uh, issues that go into um, access to scientific research. And of course, some of it's uh, human-based, uh, human research. You have to get all kinds of permissions and all kinds of approvals and oversight. And uh, it's a tangled area that very few citizens know much about. That type of question deserves a very specific answer at some point, and I hope you stay connected with, the, with, with Jerry and Toby and, and Tim. They ought to be able to find out the, uh, the more precise uh, uh, relationship. Well, I can read you the exemption. Go ahead. I mean, the exemption says um, valuable formulas, designs, drawings, computer source code or object code, and research data, very broad, right? Obtained by any agency within five years <coughs> of the request for disclosure. And then here's the key part, when disclosure would produce private gain and public loss. So the, if you read that, it's almost like the agency, in this case the university, I think we were talking about, would have to document that disclosure of the information would result in private gain and public loss. And I'd almost have to link to the case law to determine what that actually means. It gets kind of complex because oftentimes the agency is not in the best position to know whether the information is a trade secret or whether the information is confidential. And a lot of times the person that submits the, or the corporation that submits the information will just make a, a blanket statement that it is a trade secret and that it is disclosure would cause private loss. But you know what? We just had a new exemption passed into law the last session, which would protect the portfolio of the University of Washington. They do quite a bit of investing to preserve their assets on behalf of the public, and they get donations to the University of Washington. And they don't want the portfolio generally, um, well, they use private investment companies, and so the private investment companies don't want their strategy disclosed because a private investment company, their strategy is unique and that's how they distinguish themselves from other private investment companies. And so they, you know, if they have a return of 20%, they don't want to tell how they invest it because if everybody starts investing the same way, then they're all going to get the same return. And so, but you know, to me, I'm not a stockbroker. I have no idea why an investment strategy succeeds or doesn't succeed, and I think a lot of it is somewhat like gambling in the stock market. Uh, the stock market can fall out and does periodically. So, but it get it does get kind of complex, and agencies are not always in the best position. My advice to agencies when there's an assertion of trade secret is to talk with your attorney if you think it's confidential. Uh, you might take that position, but uh, if you don't think it's confidential, then you leave it up to the private entity to come forward and file an injunctive action in Superior Court.